the health unto death. If such a thing as a psychoanalysis of today's prototypical culture were possible, if the absolute predominance of the economy did not beggar all attempts at explaining conditions by the psychic life of their victims, and if the psychoanalysts had not long since sworn allegiance to those conditions, such an investigation would, would needs show the sickness proper to the time to consist precisely in normality. The libidinal achievements demanded of an individual behaving as healthy in body and mind are such as can be performed only at the cost of the profoundest mutilation of internalized castration in extroverts, beside which the old renunciation of identification with the father is the child's play as which it was first rehearsed. The regular guy, the popular girl, have to repress not only their desires and insights, but even the symptoms that in bourgeois times resulted from repression. Just as the old injustice is not changed by a lavish display of light, air, and hygiene, but is in fact concealed by the gleaming transparency of rationalized big business, the inner health of our time has been secured by blocking flight into illness without in the slightest altering its etiology. The dark closets have been abolished as a troublesome waste of space and incorporated in the bathroom. What psychoanalysis suspected before it became itself a part of hygiene has been confirmed. The brightest rooms are the secret domain of, of feces. The verses, wretchedness remains when all is said, it cannot be uprooted, live or, live or dead, so it is made invisible instead are still more true of the psychic economy than of the sphere where abundance of goods may temporarily obscure constantly increasing material inequalities. No science has yet explored the inferno in which were forged the deformations that later emerged to, to daylight as cheerfulness, openness, sociability, successful adaptation to the inevitable and equable practical frame of mind. There is reason to suppose that these characteristics are laid down at even earlier phases of childhood development than are neuroses. If the latter result from a conflict in which instinct is defeated, the former condition, as normal as the damaged society it resembles, stems from what may be called a prehistoric surgical intervention, which incapacitates the opposing forces before they have come to grips with each other, so that the subsequent absence of conflicts reflects a predetermined outcome, the a priori triumph of collective authority, not a cure affected by knowledge. Unruffled calm, already a prerequisite for applicants receiving highly paid posts, is an image of the stifled silence that the employers of the personnel manager only later impose politically. The only objective way of diagnosing the sickness of the healthy is by the incongruity between their rational existence and the possible course their lives might be given by reason. All the same, the traces of illness give them away. Their skin seems covered by a rash printed in regular pattern, like a camouflage of the inorganic. The very people who burst with proofs of, of exuberant vitality could easily be taken for prepared corpses, from whom the news of their not quite successful decease has been withheld for reasons of population policy. Underlying the prevalent health is death. All the movements of health resemble the ref reflex movements of beings whose hearts have stopped beating. Scarcely ever does an unhappily furrowed brow bearing witness to terrible and long forgotten exertions or a moment of pathic stupidity disrupting smooth logic or an awkward gesture embarrassingly preserve a trace of vanished life. For socially ordained sacrifice is indeed so universal as to be manifest only in society as a whole and not in the individual. Society has, as it were, assumed the sickness of all individuals, and in it, in the pent-up lunacy of fascist acts and all their innumerable precursor, precursors and mediators, the subjective fate buried deep in the individual is integrated with its visible objective counterpart. And how comfortless is the thought that the sickness of the normal does not necessarily imply as its opposite the health of the sick, but that the latter usually only present in a different way the same disastrous pattern.